You screwed it up! Damn you! God damn you all to hell! Hey everyone, how's it going? If you saw my last update video, you know that we are actually going to be moving the Rick and Morty review to the end of Crossover Month. So instead, we're going to start Crossover Month with the Plan of the Apes Green Lantern. Yay. Yeah, as you can kind of guess, I'm not really jazzed about this. Published in 2017, this would be the second big crossover with GL. The first being a year prior, as we saw Hal Jordan and the other Green Lanterns encounter the Kelvin timeline of Star Trek in a story called The Spectrum Wars. I honestly could not find any information on how or why this crossover came to be doing research on this. The closest I got was an interview on the website Bleeding Cool with some of the heads of Boom Studios, like Vice President Hank Kennels the current holders of the comic rights to The Planet of the Ape. And you may recall being the publishing company that brought us one of the best Christmas comics out there, Klaus, and would later do another crossover with TMNT and their Power Rangers line. But that's for next time. As for the interview, there wasn't much he said. It was just all about how cool this crossover was going to be and how a Green Lantern ring seeking out he who is utterly honest and born without fear, landing in the world of The Planet of the Apes would be filled with unlimited potential. But that's it. I know it was probably just so they could cash in on Green Lantern after they saw the success with the Green Lantern Star Trek crossover. Hell, they already did a crossover with Star Trek before, and that turned out pretty good, so they probably thought this was going to be a safe bet. Now, before we discuss the comic, I should do a brief background on two of the franchises. The Planet of the Apes was based off a novel by French author Pierre Boulle. The story focuses on an astronaut by the name of Taylor who finds himself on a planet full of intelligent apes. At first, believing that it was another planet, tries to find a safe haven while also uncovering the race's true origin, only to discover that it was in fact Earth the whole time and that he was flung into the far future. The film would lead to several sequels, with the second film, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, diving more into what happened to humanity after the apes took over, with one half reverting to a more primal state, which we did see in the first film, with the other half going underground but mutating and gaining psychic powers, worshipping a nuke under the belief that it was their god. There would also be three more sequels after that, but I won't really get into that since the first two are the only stories that really get dived into in this. As for Green Lantern, most know the basics. A human by the name of Hal Jordan is given an alien ring and a lantern-shaped battery that grants him the power to create constructs with his sheer willpower. He's inducted into the group known as the Green Lantern Corps, intergalactic law enforcement that deals with a whole bunch of crap. However, to those who are fairly new to the comics, there are other lanterns like the Sinestro Corps or the Yellow Lanterns who are powered by fear and led by Hal Jordan's arch nemesis, Sinestro. The Red Lantern Corps powered by Ray and then we have the Blue Lanterns, who are powered by the Light of Hope, the Star Sapphires, or the Violet Corps, powered by Love, the Orange Corps, powered by Avarice, the Indigo Tribe, powered by Compassion, with the last two being the White Lantern and Black Lantern, powered by Life and Death. Oh, and there's also the Ultra Violet Corps and the Gold Corps, but that's a whole other thing, and that wouldn't even come into play until much later. So let's move on and just get into this damn dirty comic. Warning, spoilers. Our story begins with a mysterious cloak figure bounding and gagging several lanterns, from different cores, including the only orange lantern, Larflees, which is not an easy task given that with him being the only lantern in his core, he's essentially an entire army in one. Meanwhile, on the planet of the ape, we see that something crashed on the planet, leaving a massive crater. This draws the attention to both Nova, a primitive human who joined Taylor on his journey in the original film, and Cornelius, an ape who assisted Taylor along with his fiance, Dr. Zira. He's been looking for Taylor after the events of the film, but this has halted his search for now, as him and Nova discover something in the crater a ring that seems to be shifting in color. Cornelius takes it and brings it to the lab to show Zira, who isn't exactly thrilled that he took something that seems to be drawing so much power that he was able to create that crater. But Cornelius argues that he had no choice. And essentially this whole moment is just a rundown of what's been going on after the events of Planet of the Apes after Taylor's escape, which led the cities to go through utter chaos. And the film's antagonists, Dr. Zaius and General Ursus of the second film, are trying to keep things under control as much as possible, no matter the cost. So leaving something that could potentially be a powerful weapon for them to use? Yeah, makes sense, but it seems kind of odd that Cornelius is the one doing this. I got more into this when I discussed characters, but if this is meant to be a sequel to the first film, Cornelius is definitely way out of character here, since though a brilliant scientist and did his best to help Taylor, 
he kind of had to be pushed into it by Zira, since he was very hesitant to do anything that could be considered risky. But while that's happening, we see the Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, and his fellow GLs are in the middle of a battle with the Red Lantern Corps, who claim that they kidnapped one of their members, the same Red Lantern that we saw in the beginning. They succeed at defeating them, but still unsure on what was going on. Meanwhile, we learn that the identity of the mysterious cloaked man in the beginning is none other than Hal Jordan's old nemesis, Sinestro. And it was so important to keep his identity a secret because... Because... Eh, cause shut up. Anyway, Sinestro has drained these lanterns of their power to help gain his true prize, the Universal Ring. As he heads off, Hal gets an alert from his ring regarding a cross chronal disruption. His bosses, the Guardians of the Universe, tell him not to worry. Yeah, I'm not sure why they thought that would work, since it's Hal Jordan they're talking to. A character that, as many will point out, don't always trust the Guardians. Back at the Ape Universe, Cornelius soon learns what kind of power the mysterious ring has. And at the same time, Hal runs into Sinestro, who makes a cryptic threat about what he he's planning to do. And as the two plunge into a portal that takes them to the Planet of the Apes, the ring gives Cornelius the power of the Yellow Lanterns. But when encountering the mutants from the second film, turns red and blasts one of them. He also learns they have Taylor and brings Cornelius to him. Unfortunately, Taylor, the human that kickstarted the whole damn series, is unceremoniously reduced to a vegetable due to the mutants probing his mind. And yes, Taylor wasn't in the sequels after the first film, but that's because Charlton Heston had no interest in returning to the series. Series. This is a comic where the limitation is mostly their imagination. I say mostly because occasionally copyright crap or some editorial nonsense. But in this case, it's mostly imagination. Anyway, Cornelius mourns and tries to understand his newfound power. We see how get put into Taylor's position, but gets help sooner from Zira along with her nephew Lucius. Elsewhere, Sinestro meets with Dr. Zaius, where he has an interesting proposal. And back in the DC Universe, we see the rest of the GLs learn what's happening with Hal and Sinestro along with this new ring in the Apes world. With the result, so fellow Green Lantern, Guy Garner, getting the assistance from their universe's own talking ape, Gorilla Grodd. So Solovar, his son Nambi, Kong Gorilla, Sam Simeon, Detective Chimp, or any other super intelligent ape hero or just unavailable guy. We just had to go with a villain and had to be the worst of the worst too. And he wonders why Batman punched him. So you guys were probably wondering what exactly is the Universal Ring, what it might be doing to Cornelius, how will Hal handle this madhouse that they call a Planet. What exactly is Sinestro planning to do with Dr. Zaius? And how long will it take for Guy to realize that working with Grodd is a bad idea? Well, you can read that for yourself if you want to find out, but I'll be honest, I'm very tempted to just tell you. But I promised myself after Long Halloween I was going to do that again, so yeah. I'm not a fan of this crossover, and I honestly have been having a hard time staying invested. From beginning to end, it felt half-assed and kind of confused on what exactly it wanted to be. Like the aforementioned revealed with Sinestro. The way the scene is played out, it acts like that's a massive revelation and that we all should be super shocked. But given that he's kind of a go-to villain for GL and that he was all over the promotion for the comic, I'm pretty sure no one was shocked that it was him. I will say the interactions with Sinestro and Zaius are interesting, but, but even that gets a bit predictable on where that's going. And look, if you like this crossover, that's fine. I wish no ill will against you, but for me, don't need a chimp to tell you that I wasn't a fan. Especially for me, at least, it stopped being a crossover with Planet of the Apes and just became a full-on Green Lantern story that happened to be on the Planet of the Apes once Guy and the others joined the fight in the middle of issue two. It also seems that the writer, Robbie Thompson, kind of mixed up a few things regarding the Green Lantern lore. Like when some characters get a yellow power ring of fear, it seems to be because they are afraid, but the thing is, that's not how the ring works. The yellow ring of the Sinestro Corps are given to people who are capable of instilling fear, which is why characters like Scarecrow or Super Mario Prime could become members. As for Thompson as a writer, he's done some pretty solid comics, like his time on Spider-Man Deadpool in 2017 till the conclusion of the series in 2019 was pretty solid, and I really dug his run on Suicide Squad, but here, he really did not feel like he was on his any game. Anyway, let's get into the character, starting with Cornelius, who, as I mentioned before, is a bit out of character, since he's way more abrasive and more of a risk taker than he was in the film, while also kind of losing his mind. Now, of course, this is due to the universe Universal Ring, but though brief, he was shown to be already out of character in the beginning. Plus, this could make things difficult for some readers who are fairly new to apes, because from beginning to end, this ape just doesn't feel like Cornelius. Maybe Caesar, given the savior complex he gains as he learns more about his power, which could have been something fascinating to dive into, but in the end, his story kind of goes the obvious 
route. Next, we get our kinda, more than that in a moment, main Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. And he essentially just goes through Taylor's story from the film, just less dark and nihilistic, since as Hal and Sinestro go into the world of the Planet of the Apes, their rings mysteriously lose power. He tries to explain who he is, but Zeus brushes it off, eventually getting the help from Zira, her nephew Lucius, and a filler in Cornelius' spot, Milo, from Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Now, to explain the kind of main Green Lantern line, it's because once the other lanterns show up in the middle of issue two, kind of just blends in the background up until the end where he has to make a monologue to Zeus about how he needs to change how things work in this world, but that's about it. Zira's story up until issue three is pretty much a rehash of the story in the film. As I mentioned several times now, in the beginning of the story, Zira and Cornelius start out swapping personalities. But while Cornelius kind of stays like that throughout the story, Zira does eventually return to her more film accurate personality. Unfortunately, that doesn't save her character from being uninteresting, as besides helping Hal and worrying about Cornelius, she has nothing going on. Which is kind of a waste, since honestly the story would have been more interesting if she was the one who found the Universal Ring. I mean, why not? She's the one that pushes Cornelius to do what he did in the film, and showed that she really wanted to make a difference in her society. Unfortunately, it doesn't get better for her character after she reunites with Cornelius. But I won't say too much due to spoilers on that, except that it's kind of a good thing Kyle Rayner wasn't here. Finally, I'm going to talk about Dr. Zeus and Sinestro, who are honestly one of the few things I'll say were generally interesting in the story, at least for a while. Essentially, we see Zeus facing someone who, though is not human, he sees as a living embodiment of what he feared and what man could be, but is forced to assist him and hoping that he'll keep to his word and eventually leave his planet once he gets what he wants, at the same time maybe getting rid of those who he believes will destroy Abe's society. Sinestro, though, I think is the weakest of the two, since though these days Sinestro has grown past his traditional mustache twirling villain persona in more recent comics, this comic kind of goes back to basics with him, and it is why I say that it's interesting for a while and not for the entire story, since by a point it just gets tiresome and that we're just going around in circles with these two. As for the rest of the cast, like the other Lanterns, Grodd, General Ursus, or any of the mutants, I'm gonna be honest here, there is nothing I could say about them. They don't do or say anything worth discussing, which is even more disappointing for someone like Grodd, who though his presence feels out of place in a Green Lantern story, does work well for a Planet of the Apes story, given his origin and motivation. Unfortunately, it just feels like a waste to me. A crossover should be a fun and creative way to see interactions that we probably would never see anywhere else, but it's just nothing here. The art was done by Barnaby Baginda, and he's fine, pretty good on most parts, but there are a few hiccups, like Hal's face without his mask kind of starts to look a bit off, kind of resembling a badly sculpted Ken doll, and then there's how he draws the Red Lantern Dexter, who in the comics is an Earth Cat, who after a tragic event regarding the loss of his owner, gains the power of the Red Lantern, and though now having the power of flight, creating constructs, having acid-like blood, and even has a limited ability to talk, he looks like a regular cat. But for some reason, Begina draws him in a anthropomorphic style. It's kind of weird looking. It's more of a nitpick since Dexter is mostly in the background, but it was pretty distracting. In the end, the Planet of the Apes Green Lantern crossover is one of the laziest crossovers I have ever read. It's not the worst, but it doesn't truly embrace both franchises, clearly favoring the other. Most of its characters are dull, and as mentioned many times before, feel out of character. And though it does tease out a sequel at the end, it's safe to say that after the rights went back to Marvel, it's safe to say that it's never going to happen, and nothing of value was lost. So yeah, sorry again to those who may like the story, but for me, this is one comic that though I should, I honestly don't think it's worth an ape pun. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, and next time we talk about something a little bit more fun as it's morphing time, turtle style. Later. Man, I think this is the most I've ever said the word unfortunately. Seriously, it's starting to lose all meaning to me.